So hi, and welcome to Poetry Passages. I'm Clifford Rames, and it's so great to be back with a new installment of the David Budbill Poetry Series, a celebration of the life and poetry of poet David Budbill, presented to you in partnership with the literary estate of David Budbill. And just as a reminder, David Budbill was a beloved poet and playwright from Vermont, uh, over the course of his lifetime, David authored eight books of poetry and seven plays. And even though we lost David in 2016, his legacy lives on. And David continues to win over and influence new generations of poetry lovers and writers. Joining me today to share some of his experience, experiences with and thoughts about David Budbill is award-winning composer, Eric Nielsen. Hi, Eric. Hi, Clifford. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so Eric's musical compositions have been performed in Canada, Europe, Asia, South America, and Australia, as well as throughout the United States, including at Kennedy Center and the Carnegie Recital Hall in New York City. So Eric, it's great to have you with us today. Thank you so much for offering to share some of your insights and thoughts about David Budbill. And I understand that you and David go back about 20 years or so, even more. Yes. Yeah. Can you recount for us how you, how you, the story of how you first met him? Yes. Um, in 1997 or 1998, I was commissioned to write an opera. And because I was given carte blanche for the uh, subject matter, I decided that I wanted to write an opera with a Vermont setting and a Vermont story, because as far as I knew, nothing like that had been done before, uh, mm -hmm. certainly not by a Vermont composer. And I looked at a lot of different sources, and the one that I kept coming back to was David Budbill's um, first uh, large poetry cycle and then later play, Judavine. And I'd never met David. I had seen him. Uh, once from a distance, but that was it. <laughs> and, um, I decided that the only way to find out whether I could move forward on this was to give him a call. This is back in the days when people all had landlines. <laughs> names were in a phone book. <laughs> and you found them in the phone book? I did find him in the phone book. <laughs> and Wonderful. I called him up and I said, hi, you don't know me. My name's Eric Nielsen. I'm a composer and I have two questions for you. Number one, has anyone ever made an opera out of parts of Judavine? And number two, if not, would you be interested in working with me on creating one? And he said no to the first question and yes to the second. <laughs> and so that was how we got started. Wow. We met a number of times and we were on the same figurative page, so to speak, in terms of which of the many, many storylines that are in Judavine we would choose um, mm -hmm. as, as the main line for the opera. And that was the story of Tommy, who's a young uh, returning uh, Vietnam veteran. Uh, he comes back to this small northern Vermont town of Judavine, very changed from the way he left it. And uh, it's a love story between him and Grace, who is a, a very, um, despised member of the community. She's on fair and, and there are a number of people who think that she's just scum. And the two of them fall in love. Um, unfortunately, it's a, it's a tragic story. Tommy takes his own life and Grace really um, loses her mind afterwards. A perfect, perfect subject for an opera, right? <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, and for folks who may not know, uh, Judifying by David Budbill is a wide ranging collection of poems and stories um, in a book um, and in the form of a narrative about a fictional northern Vermont town called Judifying. Um, And the book was later adapted into a play and then into an opera by, by Eric Nielsen here. So for the opera, you landed on the title, uh, A Fleeting Animal. Um, where did the title come from and, and where and when was the, the opera performed? Um, the title comes from a poem within a collection. It's uh, 
Tommy is a poet as well as being a veteran. And he is talking about his and Grace's love and how evanescent it is, how brief and how intense. And he says, when I give myself to you, when you give yourself to me, we make a fleeting animal of such beauty, grace, uh, beauty, power, nakedness, and grace that I'm mm -hmm. had uh, when it is done um, because something so beautiful could not survive. I'm paraphrasing the last part right. there. Um, and so we, David and I decided on that for a title and it, it stuck. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the opera was first performed, its first run was done in the fall of 2000, and it was done in three locations in Vermont and a total of six performances. And uh, afterwards, people would come up to David years afterwards, and sometimes to me also, and say, hey, when's that opera going to be? <laughs> and, and, you know, David said to me at one point, look, no matter what happens, we're not going to produce it because it'll just kill us if we have to produce it ourselves. So, of course, what happened was we produced it. <laughs> but, but what we did was we got together a group of, of volunteers to make a board and to sort of spread the labor out. And um, in 16 months, we raised enough money to, to pay everybody. And we had a little bit left over. And we had six wonderful performances in mm -hmm. 2015. 2015, um, yeah. Yes, and uh, those are available on Vimeo. Um, uh, both the one one film of Act One and one film of Act Two, um, from the final performance uh, mm -hmm. on September twentieth, two thousand fifteen. And wow. so, if you Google uh, Vimeo a "Fleeting Animal" September twenty, two thousand fifteen, the videos will will come up. Right. Yeah, I, I also saw them on YouTube. So I'll put a link to those yeah. in the in the video in the info section below this video afterwards. Oh, um, great. Prior to you calling David Budville, looking looking him up in the phone book and calling him way back when, yes. uh, you obviously were familiar with his work and were a, a fan, so I suppose, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I was familiar with his work a little bit, mm -hmm. but uh, I got much more familiar with it when we were <laughs> there, certainly. And then, um, it, believe it or not, A Fleeting Animal was our first um, collaboration. I mean, it was the most direct collaboration because he worked on things and he would send them to me and I would send him back revisions and it was a lot of back and forth. Um, but afterwards, I started working with his poems and I worked with a lot of his different poetry and there the collaboration was more sequential. That is, he had already written these works, I got permission to use them, and then I set them to music uh, in a variety ways. Right. Um, so there are choral settings, there are individual vocal settings. Um, uh, and I started, uh, I think, the first set of his poems about a year after the uh, premiere of A Fleeting Animal. And I went on from there. So what, 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 how was it? What was it like working with David Budville? And how were you guys managing the process of writing and rewriting and revising and well, one of the things that was wonderful about working with David was he was a jazz guy. Uh -huh. What that means is uh, he loved improvisation and he loved trying things differently each time. Yeah. And so um, he, he was well known, at least to those of us who knew him, for going into a production of one of his plays. And when he saw what the individual actors were doing, he would rewrite things to suit them. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, during from one day to the next, right. and bring in some new lines in rehearsal. And so what he did for this, it gave him, him a chance to revisit this particular um, storyline in, in Judavine and do new things with it. So for instance, um, there are three completely new characters in the opera that are only referred to very briefly mm. One of them is uh, the embodiment of Tommy's PTSD, somebody he calls the angel of depression in his poems. And I, that was my idea. I said to David, 
we really need her to be a character. She is a siren and she keeps calling Tommy and eventually he goes with her. Um, and then there is a very, very brief mention in a, a scene where Tommy is having an argument with uh, a fellow logger, Doug, and uh, Doug mentions that he's seen Tommy hanging out with his, well, he calls them nigger friends. Um, and we don't hear anything more about this, but David created two characters, mm -hmm. and James, and they were friends of Tommy's from their time serving together in Vietnam. And um, they're wonderful characters. And uh, so I, I was thrilled with this because they add a whole different aspect to life in this town. I mean, they're the only black people there. And they, they really shake things up. And um, so it was wonderful working with these characters and this oh, hot off the presses set of, of people that, that were new for both me and David. So that was really wonderful. Well, and, and that reminds me of the, um, the, the poet, and I saw this on the back of, of Judivine, which that's the book right there, um, that the poet Hayden Carruth uh, described David Budbill as an American Chekhov, Anton Chekhov, the Russian writer. How would you describe David? I mean, uh, what were your first impressions of him, and and did those impressions change over the years once you got to know him? I was very nervous <laughs> because what I had read of David's was actually um, essays. Before I read Judavine, I'd read some essays and they were pretty political. And he was a guy who didn't mince words. Mm -hmm. He he thought very much that Vermont was in danger of becoming one large theme park. And um, and so I thought, okay, this guy could be really difficult to work with. I'm gonna try, but let's see what happens. And he wasn't like that at all. I mean yeah was um he was really flexible and he was nice and we I, I i think we got on really well um i always considered him a friend and uh -huh. uh, and the interesting thing is um this is an opera about a lot of things it's about a small town but it's also about um someone who comes home from war damaged and um but it's a sympathetic picture of a veteran and it was written by two people who were both conscientious objectors during the vietnam war mm. and so i've always thought that that was a bit ironic but in, an interesting little little fact and the more i got to know david the more his background reminded me of actually my father's background david wasn't that much older than i but he um he was a he grew up in a very blue collar area of um uh, of cleveland his father was a, a bus driver and or a streetcar driver and so he never lost that feeling of um working class of keeping his working class roots and my father grew up on the lower west side of manhattan 1930s and he always kept a really and he was also a writer and he kept a a, a a a good handle on his on his his roots as well yeah yeah well i thought it'd be time to get to some poetry and i know that you have um probably many favorites but one in particular that you um wanted to read today and that's called bugs in a bowl and which comes out of moment to moment poems of a mounted recluse um, published in 1999 by Copper Canyon Press. And it's just a, a delightful, humorous little poem. So I was hoping you would read that first. I would be happy to. And it's, uh, <laughs> we did a, a set of concerts very recently. And uh, my contribution was a set of four songs. 
And one of the songs in it is my setting of Bugs in a Bowl. And I was told after I read the poem at a, a panel discussion that I actually was following a lot of the rhythms that are in the music that I made. So that may happen now, but for people who haven't ever heard the song, it won't make any difference. So here is Bugs in a Bowl. Hansan, that great and crazy, wonderful Chinese poet of a thousand years ago said, we're just like bugs in a bowl, all day going around, never leaving their bowl. I say, that's right. Every day, climbing up the steep sides, sliding back, over and over again, around and around, up and back down. Sit in the bottom of the bowl, head in your hands, cry, moan, feel sorry for yourself. Or, Look around. See your fellow bugs. Walk around. Say, hey, how you doing? Say, nice bowl. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you, can't, you, you can't help but smile uh, oh, man. at that poem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had somebody who was a friend of David's once when I, I had first set that to music and I was in a copy place and he came in and he happened to glance over my shoulder and he said, you set bugs in a bowl to music? <laughs> and he was really excited. Great. Well, and, and as you mentioned, um, you, you, you did perform that poem at the recent musical production um, held over two nights in Vermont. And that was called Sutras for a Suffering World, uh, the poetry of David Budbill set to music. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that event um, and your role in putting it together, as well as uh, some of the other people who were involved? Well, um, the people who really deserve the credit for putting it together are Lois Eby, David's widow, uh, their daughter, Nadine Budbilt, who is the executor of David's literary estate. Um, they really pushed for this. And it was originally scheduled for 2020, but of course... Mm -hmm. COVID happened, um, and they partnered with um, a Vermont husband and wife team of musicians, um, Mary Bonhag, the soprano, and her husband, Evan Primo, who is a bassist and composer, and together they're called Scrag Mountain Music. And so they were the performers with a couple of other people, and then Lois and uh, Nadine invited David's longtime collaborator, the avant-garde bassist and composer, uh, William Parker, to come up from New York uh, with an ensemble. And so um, I took uh, a set of, a musical set that I'd done way back in 2002 called Reflections on the Way, which was originally for orchestra and female singer. And I cut it down so it was for flute, bass, piano and singer. Um, and uh, Evan had written a set of songs also using the same instrumentation. And so his set and my set were the first half of the program. And then William and his ensemble performed the second half of the program. So, uh, and, and the interesting thing is that we, they were close to 30 poems and there were no duplications, which I thought was wonderful. So it was a, it was a, it was a great event. Yeah. Well, I confess I was there for both nights and um, I have to say it was wonderful, particularly uh, the second night, the energy of the second night in Montpelier was just amazing. Um, yeah. just, it was the home crowd. The home it was the home crowd sold out. Yeah. Um, and I understand that it's um, not online yet, but are there any plans to put it online or. Well, if, I know if, a recording if, was made. Yeah. If it were yeah. up to me, I'd say, yeah. Um, <laughs> I it's it's uh, I know that the I'm pretty sure the recordings are being processed. It was both video and audio recorded. Um, there was some talk of uh, putting it out as a double CD. Um, I don't know what's going to happen, but I will make sure that I update you. Uh, sure. So yeah. that when uh, when whatever it is comes out, we'll put it up. Yeah. 
Yeah, excellent. Um, well, and, and so can you tell us a little bit about some of the feedback you got back? I know it was a sold out crowd and, and, and just from what I heard walking around afterwards, people were amazed, but what have you heard? I mean, what was some of the feedback I, you got? I had um, people uh, congratulate me um, both on my piece and on the concert. Um, I had uh, somebody uh, who would come especially for the concerts up from uh, Washington, D.C. And <laughs> he said that my piece uh, brought tears to his eyes, uh, yeah. um, which is pretty high praise, I would say. Um, it just, people were buzzing during intermission and after the concert. I mean, they just, the whole event was, was just spectacular. And so I got a lot of praise for my piece, but um, it, the entire event was just um, superb. I mean, it was one of the best um, concerts I've ever attended. Um, I agree. I agree. It was it was it was amazing. Um, and I, well, in addition to to being a composer, I understand that you're also a performer. You you sing, and um, <laughs> he rolls his eyes. <laughs> well, no, it's just um, you know, it's funny if you're a tenor, um, even if you're not a very good one. Uh, you could be busy all the time because there just aren't that many tenors. <laughs> there's, there's even a there's even a play called "Lend Me a Tenor." But <laughs> well, David's widow, David's wife uh, Lois, told me that I must absolutely must ask you to read and sing uh, David's poem uh, "What Isa Heard," and which is also from Moment to Moment. There again. Uh, so I was curious, hoping that you would do it for us. Well, I'd be happy to. I'm going to preface <laughs> it by saying that as much as I love bugs in a bowl, and I do, what Isa heard is my favorite poem of David's of all. And uh, part of it is because it's so beautiful. And part of it is because it speaks about the importance of art in comforting, in giving us joy, in fulfilling us. Yeah. And and uh, that's why I think it, it's so wonderful. So I'll, I'll read it first. Um, and the setting, this particular setting, um, I've set the poem to music three times. So um, you heard one setting at that concert. I also did another setting that was just for unaccompanied chorus. And then for um, a celebration of David's life that took place about nine months after his death. Um, to close out the program, I did another setting that I taught to the audience so that they could sing along. And that's the one that I will, I will sing for you in a minute. Thank you. What Isa heard. 200 years ago, Isa heard the morning birds singing sutras to this suffering world. I heard them too this morning which must mean since we will always have a suffering world, we must also always have a song. Yeah. 200 years ago, Isa heard the morning birds singing sutras to this suffering world. I heard them to this morning, which must mean, since we will always have a suffering world, we must also always have a song. Beautiful. Thank you, Eric. Thank you so much. No, oh, you're welcome. Oof. <laughs> oh, so, um, where do we go from there? Yeah. <laughs> so, any 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 future plans? Any upcoming um, any plans for other David Budbill related events down the road? Uh, a Judivine revival, perhaps, or 
Um, well, um, my hope is that both the play, Judah Vine, uh, which has been revived a number of times, um, including, I think, right after David died, there was a production. Um, my hope is that that will be revived again. And my other hope is that someplace along the line, we can do a fleeting animal again. Yeah. And, um, Mounting an opera takes a tremendous amount of energy, and um, <laughs> it's it's something that people still speak to me about. So I know that it still resonates with them, and that includes performers, people who performed in it, as well as uh, audience members. And so um, I would love to do it. We'll just have to see what shows up, you know. Yeah terms of somebody having the energy to to lend a hand to make sure it happens um, i would certainly love that to to be something that came to fruition because i think it should be done everywhere and right. i'm not the only one who feels that way right and and well and that's kind of why we started doing the the series of programs about david's legacy because his stuff is just too good. We don't want it to fade away. And we want more and more people to be able to discover it and 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 learn um well, what David had to say, this and this beauty that he offered out of his soul that Absolutely. he shared that he shared with the rest of us. Um, it deserves to be to be learned about and, and read and heard and seen. And, so and celebrated. And celebrated, yeah. So great. Well, thank you, Eric. This has been wonderful. Um, any last thoughts from you? What do you have come going on sort of in terms of your own composing uh, or performing? Well, um, anything good? Composing. Uh, I just yesterday sent off uh, a piano trio to a group that's going to be performing it this coming season. So I'm excited about that. I'm also in the initial stages of planning a concert during the pandemic when we couldn't have anything performed except on YouTube. I wrote a number of um, solo works and uh, they were done, you know, via video, via Zoom or something, but I want to do them in concert. And so I'm, I'm working on putting together a concert of that. And then the other thing is my second opera um, is in the process of being kind of chopped around so that we can try and, and get that mounted as well. So I'm, I'm staying busy. Great, great. Well, good luck with all that. And I look forward to, thank you. to anything that you do next. And well, again, thank, thank you, you so much for coming on and, and, and sharing your thoughts and insights about David and, and, and for reading that poem and singing that wonderful version of what he's heard. It's, it's a blow away. <laughs> blow away version <laughs> <laughs> it was it was an honor truly so wow. asking me thank you thank you so much for coming on and i hope everyone enjoyed that uh, eric nielsen our special guest today and we look forward to seeing you again right here on poetry passages stay well and stay safe and bye bye eric thank you okay bye <laughs>